Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. On the show today, we have Stephen Greenhut, writer for uh, Orange County Register and uh, American Spectator, uh, Cal Watchdog, and occasionally the Wall Street Journal, also the, the author of Plunder and uh, the Western Director of the R Street Institute, among other things. And uh, also we have uh, Mike Murphy, uh, Uber driver, and therefore qualified to write uh, the forthcoming Americans versus Macy and Uber versus Taxis. Uh, that's in addition to the Greens and uh, the government, his uh, previous two books. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, the gray market epitomized by Uber and taxis and by Airbnb versus Hilton and by uh, Amazon versus Macy's. Is this the way that uh, the economy is going? Yes, definitely. It's uh, the technology itself, as we knew it was going to, is uh, presenting all kinds of options and opportunities. And it's moving so fast that a lot of people really can't kept, keep up with it, what it's really doing and what the underpinnings of it are. And a lot of the uh, older corporations and older business methodology has to adapt and change, but sometimes the boards of directors on those organizations aren't, they're falling asleep at the wheel, so to speak. In other words, Macy's should have been Amazon. They had the credit card base, they had the warehousing, they had the stores, they had everything. But they were asleep at the wheel as Amazon slept, uh, moved right around them in record time. And now they're hurting and scared to death. Then you have the taxi companies and Uber comes out with a new application and all this great stuff and works its way around the whole legal system by not paying any of the mandatory taxi fees and regulation fees and things that they have to pay. And they, they snuck right around the taxi industry the same way. The taxi industry was asleep at the wheel. Now, of course, now uh, taxis are getting the apps on their computers. They use the GPS navigation and all that sort of thing, too. But it's displaced the taxi industry. Many of uh, the smaller companies are filing for bankruptcy and so on and so forth as Uber and Lyft takes over and other rideshare opportunities are coming, too. Now, are the uh, companies that like Uber or Lyft, are, are they uh, going to be able to fend off the legal challenges from uh, politicians and, and uh, lawsuits. I know in Austin, for instance, uh, Austin, Texas, Uber is, has been essentially driven out of town. Well, you know, and they spend a lot of money on advertising. So the press has been really soft on it. The public loves the low rates and so on and so forth. You know, it does keep a lot of drunk drivers off the road because of the low rate, they're more willing to take an Uber or a Lyft than they were a taxi at the greater expense. And so there's a lot of social benefit to the programs. However, it's all rested on the driver's income. Most of the drivers are unaware that of their expenses, their own expenses. When I interviewed 50 Uber drivers and 20 Lyft drivers, they consistently did not know what their per mile expenses were, which they could have looked up with AAA or with the uh, U.S. government tax standards, and it's 58 cents a mile. And they didn't know that. They were unaware. One guy guessed 54, and he was pretty spot on, drove airport rides in the Bay Area and made some money. But most are making about six bucks an hour plus tips. And if people aren't tipping, then they're not even making that. And they don't realize it. And most of them do around three or four months into it, realize they're not making money. Uh, they can't afford their first set of tires they've got to replace. Or they realize their new car warranty burn out in a year and a half versus five years. So um, the taxi companies charging, what, two or three times as much money as, as Uber or Lyft, are they making a whole, or were they making a lot of monopoly profits? Well, they were a business, so if they stayed in business, yes. You know, they had to be making some money, but they also owned the cars much, much of the time and knew what their expenses were. We've got to replace these vehicles once in a while, so on and so forth. So there was a reason for their higher rates, not to mention keeping up with regulation and medallions and things like that with various cities who had different, differing regulations and so on and so forth. But I think some of them were eking by a living, but even that was never an industry you're going to work in and get rich from. Well, if, if you're the owners of the cab companies who've bought up all the medallions, I mean, the whole, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole cab issue, the whole cab, uh, taxi cab cartel is what it was. And it's, yeah. it's really a good thing that that's collapsing. It was all based on government privileges. We're libertarians. If the drivers, you know, if the drivers don't find it to be a good deal, they'll stop driving and Uber will have to pay more or we'll have to have a different deal to keep the kind of service that we have. Uh, but the taxi industry has mainly used its uh, political leverage to, to create this cartel. And when I was in San Diego um, at the Union Tribune, the, there was a report showing cab drivers were only own, earning about $5 an hour. So, What about uh, the uh, Airbnb and... Uh 
uh, other uh, apps uh, versus the hotel industry. Is that going very to be? similar concept? You know, and my book is really talking. The title of the book is going to be Macy's and the Taxis versus Amazon and Rideshare. Okay. And uh, and so that's what I'm working on. But obviously, Airbnb has a big role to play. It's very similar. Uh, same thing with eBay when it started. You know, you had all the buyers saying, "Wow, I got this great deal on something." And by the time the seller got together all of his fees and his obfuscating his expenses from PayPal and eBay and looked at it, he was making negative five bucks an hour to package ship and do each item that he was selling. But the buyer was happy as hell. They were getting all these things for dirt cheap. They were buying things cheaper than retail that was collectible that was held for 10 or 15 years. And so that was an obfuscating industry. Of course, eBay didn't want the sellers to realize, hey, you guys are working for us for nothing and actually less than nothing. And the same thing holds true for uh, Kalanick and Uber and uh, Zimmer and Lyft. And yet the competition keeps one. If one wants to do good for the drivers, his prices go up and everybody moves over to the cheaper company. The problem is obfuscation. It's what kills capitalism. It's what, it's what gives communism an excuse. Communists say, look, see how they rip each other off in capitalism? That's why you need communism, to protect you, to protect the worker. And so when a business industry falls into this, and it's a slippery slope, and it's easy to fall into this obfuscation where you kind of don't want your, your drivers or your sellers to realize how little money they're making while you're uh, walking away with the big bucks, while you're making millions off of your software and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to be worked out still, but it's caveat emptor, not just for the consumer, but for the people, for the workers too. They have to be careful what they're doing and when they get into it, they have to be business people. They have to look at their expenses. I'm guessing that one of the biggest issues for Uber and Lyft is the perception that uh, they're not as safe as uh, riding in a regular taxi. Is that, is that something that uh, is an issue for the, for the companies or for I, the drivers? I would say sometimes yes. And here's the reason. Average Uber or Lyft driver only lasts three or four months. He doesn't even get to know his territory. He's still getting used to using GPS, which is a distraction while he's driving. And so these things, uh, you want experience. Now I've been doing it for two and a half years. But a lot of people, like I say, average is three or four months. Sometimes you're meeting a driver that's only been out there for a week. And they don't know the neighborhood sometimes. Where a taxi driver in the past at least knew his neighborhood and where he was working better. Can I pipe in? I mean, it's, yeah. it's ridiculous to suggest that, that there's, there's no evidence at all that, that these, these things are, are less safe than taxis. In fact, there was this tragic taxi, uh, tra tragic Uber accident in San Francisco. And of course, the, the taxi cartel. Uh, and I mean, this is the libertarian counterpoint. Yeah. I, I'm thinking that we're on the, the, the liberal <laughs> counterpoint or no, the, the anti-capitalist counterpoint. Here. Okay, hey, but, I'm an anarchist, so you know okay, what? Okay, yeah. I'm worse. Okay, but uh, so I, I did a piece for the Union Tribute. I, was, I looked at, I started looking into taxi cab accidents. It's unbelievable. So I did a piece, and I think uh, I ran for that and in Reason magazine saying, let's ban taxi cabs using the same rationale. We know that the fact, fact that the, the taxis have a, they have a whole regimen of inspections mandated by the government and this and that, it doesn't lead to anything safer. They're just like there's no evidence that states that require safety checks of cars uh, lead to safer, safer drivers. In fact, what we learned in San Diego in the study, the taxi drivers are only earning five bucks an hour, which forces them because they have to pay off the medallion. And for the, the your, your viewers who don't know what the medallion is, the government sets a limited number of, 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 of permits to, to drive taxi cabs and they get bought up by uh, the taxi companies. And then there's an enormous fee in, in uh, New York, it's like a million dollars for a medallion. I think in San- A medallion is good for what, one cab or for- uh, For one cab, no, for one cab. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the driver has to pay that off. And I compared them in my, my article to uh, indentured servants because <laughs> they can never legally own the property. Um, so th there's, there's no safety issue. Uh, in fact, it, everything I've seen shows that these, these Uber drivers and Lyft drivers are, are, are you know, it's, a, it's hard to do a comparison. You have to look at per miles. I don't know anyone who's done it. But there's, I don't, I've never seen any evidence that they're less safe. I think they're more safe. People, they're driving their own cars often. Um, and uh, I'm going to throw something else in the mix here yeah. because I think there's something missing here. 
And that is that they, when you're making only five or six bucks an hour and you're trying to make a living or scratch by, you work 13 to 15 hours a day. You're tired on the roads. There have been numerous accidents with tired drivers. And I'm sure that's the same with taxis. If they're well, only it is. Making it five is. Well, well, that's it. well, that's the point. I mean, if, if that's the case, and I'm not sure that's the case, uh, but uh, uh, certainly with, with taxi drivers it is if you add a medallion cost on top of it. Uh, so, you know, the market, the market will sort this out. And as a consumer, we love having Uber. It's very freeing. I took it today. What uh, politician is going to, you know, Uber and Lyft ignored the medallions and ignored the laws. And the thing is, when the, what politician is going to Those aren't the laws that on. apply to them. What politician is going to ignore the public's demand and desire for Lyft and Uber. If he says he's going to outlaw Lyft and Uber, let's see what happens to that politician. He's going to lose his job. Well, well then that. you haven't been following what's, what had been going on every year in the Capitol, which is, which is efforts to uh, limit and tax and add, add different requirements. Um, now, the insurance requirement uh, wasn't a bad one, what they ended up with. It was just really a little gap it was a question over when when the insurance starts uh, on your personal car and your business insurance, but in Austin they they eliminated as you pointed out they've the, the the city officials eliminated it's it's just a they, the taxi industry is purely about politics and they tried to use their political might um, to shut down Uber and Lyft and we see that all over the world I mean in, in Paris I think after you get a a call from uh, an Uber customer you have to wait several minutes before you go I I just was in uh, Honolulu and I flew into the airport and the city has made it illegal uh, for uh, Uber to pick you up at the airport so the taxi industry is an entire regulated cartelized industry that's all about exerting government power and influence. And to say that Uber and Lyft, and this is where you're not sounding like a free market guy. Oh, I'm totally a free market uh, Oh, well, if you're saying they ignored the law. I'm a philosophical anarchist. Well, good. okay, good. Well, the, ignore the law. The law doesn't apply to them. It's this whole regulated thing. They came up with something else. It's creative destruction. It's one of the best things that's happened. And in Austin, uh, DUI rates have gone back up after now that they don't have access to uh, Uber and Lyft. So, um, well, I'm a fan of creative destruction, yeah. especially when technology is involved. However, that said, you look at um, the. This has been in. The, I did, have been in three yeah. industries. I started an industry yeah. in the aerobics academy when I trained aerobics instructors. And what happens is the larger players come in and they want to use the tool of government as a hammer against their competition so that nobody can come into their realm. Well, that, that's true with any. And it's, you know, that's and, what I'm saying. And, and, and that's just true. tries to use, ultimately exactly. tries to use. Exactly. And that's what the taxi industry has it's, done. It's a yeah. political football that's yeah. lovely for government. So the problem, the problem that we're talking about is over-regulation. Yes. And over-regulation yes. uh, incited by yes. the, the, the established players. I mean, that's, that's true in the, the moving industry. It's true... Oh, here's but think of it's your true. campaign it's true. funding. It's true. it's true in the tobacco industry. Next topic. Uh, FDA versus smokeless tobacco, e-cigs. Uh, we all know that uh, tobacco is uh, not good for you. It's not good to smoke cigarettes. We also all know that e-cigarettes uh, eliminate the tars. So all you're getting is the nicotine. So it's not nearly as uh, 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 detrimental to somebody's health. So what's happening is the tobacco companies and the states... Uh, at the tobacco company's uh, uh, behest are trying to make it really, really difficult to do smokeless tobacco. Well, they're, what they're, they keep doing in California is, is upping the tax proposition. 56 passed, $2 tax on an extra, uh, on every pack of cigarettes in addition to the previous tax, but they've also are taxing vaping products and smokeless tobacco, which is uh, like snus, like in yeah. Sweden. Uh, Sweden has the lowest uh, cancer rate in, uh, in one of the lowest cancer rates in the world. I think the lowest in Europe. And, and snoozing, which is the little smokeless tobacco, it's a spitless tobacco. It's not like chewing tobacco. It's a pasteurized tobacco product uh, that they put up in their, in their gum. Like and snuff. Except, it, well, it's confusing because snooze is a term for snuff, but it's not snuff. Oh, okay. Okay, snuff is the uh, stuff that you don't, okay. you, you don't snort it, but you inhale it, right? And, and then there's the dip, which you put in, I, I'm, I don't know, I don't use, I don't, uh, no. but, but the snooze is just a little, little, usually it's a little like tea bag that you put up in your, in your gum and you don't have to spit. 
Right. Anyway, they have very, they've been studying it for decades and they have exceedingly low cancer rates. Even mouth cancer? Even mouth cancer. Uh, and and, and they extremely low rates of periodontal disease. So, I mean, just look at, you know, look at the various studies. But the fact is, smokeless tobacco is, is tobacco cessation. A vaping is, is safer. Uh, Public Health England, the, the, the health agency in, in Britain, says it's 95% safer. Nothing's totally safe. And they encourage public policymakers to encourage smokers to try vaping. Now, I went to the uh, one of the committee meetings of the folks who get to spend all the new loot from Prop 56. The, okay, and first off, uh, they were very uh, proud of the fact that they don't have to spend a lot of that money on tobacco-related things. They, the UC system could spend it on all manner of, of medical research and paying for doctors and all sorts of stuff. So um, that's the first thing. But the, the hilarious thing, because you know these health uh, folks, the health bureaucracy, we'll just put it that way, yeah. I'm sure they're well-intentioned. <laughs> So, oh, right. yeah, so, yeah, I'm sure I'm being a little bit facetious. So they're sitting there talking about how hard it is to get people to give up cigarettes and, take, and use some of these cessation devices, like the medical devices and nicotine gum and all this other stuff. Um, and then they go right into a discussion of uh, how bad vaping is and how we shouldn't even call it, we shouldn't call it vaping, that's an industry term, we should call it smoking. But vaping is ninety five percent safer because you're not smoking. It's the it's the you don't get the tar. Well, yeah, it's the carcinogens the, from the yeah. burn. It's the burning that's yeah. the problem, yeah. right? So anyway, it's 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 nonsensical. And I was out in Contra Costa County, where the the county is uh, talking about a ban on flavored liquids, uh, just a ban in the whole county of those vaping liquids. And, okay, now yeah. the, the 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 line of reasoning that's being put out, out to the public is is that vaping or smokeless tobacco or whatever you want to call it is uh, something that will lead to toba smoking tobacco. I think right. And they they point to there was a study of teenagers, right. and it was a very I mean from what I saw and I did some interviewing on it. it, it basically, what it showed were who was who as a teenager is more likely to experiment with things. It didn't show, I see no evidence whatsoever that uh, vaping leads to, to Well, smoking. they cherry pick studies because the yeah. state, our state in California is in trouble. It spends more money than it takes in. It can't afford to fix its roads. It's been deferring maintenance on roads, bridges, dams, and the, uh, the, it came obvious through these last storm. So when you're out of money, you raise taxes on everything. You want to tax, regulate, and tax uh, and so, they're coming, so they're coming up with excuses to go after. You bet. That's well, why it's, we it's, just it's, paying the gas tax increase. Same reason. Well, for for uh, tobacco, it's uh, for Medi-Cal. I mean, for the Prop 56, the money is really a way to backfill the state's uh, Medi-Cal system, uh, medical well, care for the, poor people. The other thing that's happened, speaking of smoking, is people are smoking more funny cigarettes, or will be soon in uh, California, with uh, the legalization of recreational marijuana in addition to uh, medical marijuana. And my understanding is that in Colorado, Washington, the death rate of uh, people from uh, painkillers, from the opioids and so forth, is down 25% in medical mar or in mar illegal marijuana states. Um, do, you, do you anticipate that will happen in California as well? Well, the tax rate is so high on it and the regulations are so extreme that, I don't know, maybe people still keep buying it from, their, from the guy down the street. I don't, I don't know. But, yeah, but but I think I think generally speaking, I I would think we would we would we might see some of, some of that. I mean, part of the opioid problem or crisis is driven by the fact that the government makes it so hard for people with chronic pain to get a prescription that they're driven off into the into the uh, uh, into the black market. I mean, so marijuana might offer, you know, pain. Well, the, the other issue with marijuana, of course, is you know Colorado and Washington, now California, and I'm, I'm guessing uh, probably on the on the docket, maybe half of the states have legalized one form of marijuana or another uh, in the state, and it's all intrastate. You can't import, you can't you can't cross state lines and so forth. But at the federal level, uh, it's still a Schedule One drug, and we have an Attorney General now who is uh, who harkens back to the Nancy Reagan. Uh, you know, just say no era, and uh, just recently was uh, quoted as saying that uh, it's only just a little bit worse than heroin, or a little uh, better, or, <laughs> or something. Heroin, yeah, a little better, yeah, a little better than heroin. Only, only a little better than heroin. And so, with a, with an attorney general, Jeff Sessions, being uh, a uh, born again drug warrior, 
is that going to throw a chink in the armor of the states who have legalized marijuana? Yeah, I mean, it could. I mean, we're, we're waiting to see what's going to happen. I mean, if he decides to crack down on states that have legalized marijuana, it's, it's going to push a, you know, it's, it's, it's going to push some interesting court cases. You know, you, you make an issue and there's money on both sides for the politician. You know, people start donating your campaign from one side and then from the other. And, and it's just that it's, it's an obfuscating issue to the fact that these guys are wasting money like it goes out of style and they got to somehow fund their projects. They're taxing future generations to fight these wars. The drug war itself is so prohibitively expensive. It's been a way of controlling other nations in Central and South America. And frankly, China's coming in big on everything and doing everything that we used to do as economic hitmen and so on and so forth. And all of this stuff are obfuscating issues around the big money that's moving in very serious directions. And I think that's hurting the American people. I mean, I don't think, I mean, mar obviously the marijuana issue, there's a lot of money involved. Uh, in fact, what drove some of the legalization efforts uh, was the, the Board of Equalization and the state's taxing agency. Uh, what was happening is you, if you a, uh, if you're, have a medical marijuana clinic, you're not allowed to have a bank account under federal rules. Right. But you're still required to pay uh, excise tax to the Board of Equalization. So right. legitimate medical, medical marijuana has been legal in the state since the 90s. Right. Um, they, would be, they would be bringing sacks of cash into Board of Equalization offices which are not allowed to accept cash. That's right. Yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, so, so they're not allowed to accept cash, but I'm not allowed to have a bank account if I'm a marijuana, uh, a legitimate marijuana provider. So uh, like George Runner, one of the, the equaliz Board of Equalization members, a conservative Republican, uh, was pushing uh, for some reforms. And, and, and that was driving, I think, the legislative debate to a degree. Uh, because then we, there was a, a massive, uh, finally, what, 20 years later, the legislature last year passed a whole a package of uh, a medical marijuana regulations. It's, it applies to medical marijuana, but the whole purpose of it was to create the foundation for recreational marijuana, which they thought was going to be um, coming down the pike. And uh, knew, they knew there was going to be the initiative. So um, anyway, that, that created the, 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 the backdrop for, from it. Um, so, and then the state, Gavin Newsom was uh, on the, uh, Lieutenant Governor was on the, um, oh, what was that, uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, and they eva evaluated a lot of the issues. But I, th I think, so there's always money involved, and the old players, I I've done a couple pieces on it, the old medical marijuana players, a number of them don't want, that were opposed to legalization because they don't want the, I mean, they it's clearly, they clearly, yeah, they won't say that, but it's clear that they didn't want the competition. But I think what's happening with Sessions is an ideological issue. He's a conservative, ideologically well, okay, conservative. Well, Trump let it yeah. get by with being a, being a you know, a Nancy Reagan re, 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 retread. I, I, well, I think so. He's, he's, he's you know, I, I really, I can see just a small, a huge backlash to it. I don't think he's going to be successful, but I think it's going to bring a lot of money into the coffers of the politicians. And I think that well, you brought up another point. Uh, that you, have to, you, you have to accept cash in the United States as legal tender. And yet our government in California doesn't accept cash as payment for taxes. Well, how's Jeff Sessions? That, I, I don't think what Jeff Sessions is doing has anything to do with contributions to politicians. I mean, it's, you know, there's contributions to politicians at every level, but that's not what this is about. And, well, and what, there's, what's going to... There's legislation coming up now. Uh, Justin Amash, uh, Republican from Michigan, Tom Garrett, Republican from Virginia, Ed Blumenthal, Democrat from Oregon, mm -hmm. Tulsa Gabbard, uh, Democrat from Hawaii, along with yeah. uh, Scott Taylor from Virginia, Republican, and Don Young from uh, Alaska. They've all gotten together to sponsor or uh, co-sponsoring the Ending Federal Marijuana Prohibit Prohibit well, Prohibition Act of, of 2007. Yeah, it's great, and it has Getting virtually no chance. No right? chance? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, that would be my read. I, I don't see that it has much of a chance with the Republican Congress. I, I don't see any. I, I don't see ev any evidence of a widespread support for uh, what would it do? Remove it, do, the do schedule, it schedule one. I mean, that's a great idea. That's what needs to happen. Yeah. And um, you don't think that's going to happen? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, them, the, I, 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 I'm, I'm even with 56 or some percent of the public saying uh, legalize marijuana. Well, well, the federal government could just remove it from Section One without congressional legislation. Well, yeah, right? they, yeah, the, the drug okay. enforcement people could do that. Right, right. So you know, we, right. So they, they, even under the Obama administration, they wouldn't do it. Right. 
and we're certainly not going to see it under the under the Trump administration. Uh, so the chance of I call it the Christian wrong, and, and that's my everybody calls it the Christian right. I call it the Christian wrong. I mean, these guys want to legislate their Christian beliefs on everybody else, and it has nothing to do. No marijuana, no this, no that. And frankly, I don't see that as winning in the long run. I do see a lot of money around it, all over the place, but I don't see it winning in the long run. Well, I don't. I mean, I don't see their religious right being particularly active on the issue. I mean, I, I think, you know, you've, you've, there's this I think I think the issue is driven by fear. There's a lot of people who, for whatever reason, have had bad experiences with drugs or have heard stories of people having bad experiences with drugs. And they buy into the, you know, if you start out smoking cigarettes, you'll eventually get to marijuana and eventually you'll die of a heroin overdose. Uh, that narrative uh, was drilled into me as a kid. And of course, yeah. it's nonsense for the most part, but that narrative scares a lot of people. and. Yeah, I think that's, people that work well, sure. take people with ADHD, for example, okay? They didn't know. They weren't diagnosed, a lot of women especially when they're younger. And so they turn to marijuana because it makes them feel more normal. And uh, for a lot of them, that was their, their drug of choice. Then comes along Adderall. Well, okay, Adderall is the usual, more, most common prescription for people with ADHD because we are simply a bag of chemicals. And we use chemicals that we find seem to work to try to treat our own situation with our own biological chemicals, with us each being different, with a different quantity of chemical receptors, and a different way that we actually utilize chemicals in our brain. So these are physiological differences in each of us that are at the root of a lot of our drug usage, a lot of our adrenaline uh, desires, and so on and so forth. And those have to be considered. In other words, I'm with uh, Judge James Gray when you look at this as a health issue versus as a criminal issue. Well, it shouldn't be a criminal issue. And people, yeah. But it, it's, it's going to be, and it continues to be. And, and it's going to be interesting to see if um, you know, Sessions decides to take on states directly, right? And it's, become, it's an interesting states' rights issue. A lot of conservatives I know who typically support states' rights of course, only for those things of which they support the underlying yes. policy, right? Yes. So, so a lot of them are against states' rights issues on uh, on things like uh, well, drug the, the positive sign is in the press conference after he uh, compared heroin to uh, marijuana, uh, marijuana being only a little bit uh, better. He was asked a question by a reporter, and the question had to do with whether or not I think it's the Cole uh, uh, Memorandum or something like that mm -hmm. under the Obama administration, which essentially said that marijuana will be a low priority uh, enforcement item. Uh, we won't, in other words, the feds are not going to mess with it in legal states. And, and uh, Sessions said, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with the point. Well, then, that, then it's not going to be a big cut, right, if he doesn't challenge California and Colorado. Right. So in and, other words, it, directly, it all may be a lot of bluster for yeah. the purpose of keeping the social conservatives uh, and anti-drug people happy, uh, but, not, but, but no substance. Well, let's hope. And the That's federal the government we, has a wall. Yeah, okay. I, I just got the end of the show time. We're going to do that. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much.